Hi everyone, I'm Matthew Jude here on Watch It Played and this is a new series that we're doing and it's called Matthew Answers the Internet. A bold name? You betcha! <laughs> I classically do spend almost 95% of my time on the internet and I see these questions. These board gamery questions about how this or how do I do that or what you think about this. So what I thought was I'd collate some of those questions that I've got burning answers to and deliver them to you in the form of a video. So this is Matthew Answers the Internet episode 1 which doesn't mean it's a series yet. But who knows? <laughs> but also, this is a great way to crowdsource a few answers as well, because you, the person at home or wherever you are, can also just comment below with your answers to these questions. So let's hit the ground running, go for question one. And I'll be honest, it's the question I am, I'm the most nervous about answering on the internet. And that is because the question one is, do miniatures really enhance the board game experience? Which games really shine? with all those miniatures. In obviously games like X-Wing or 40K, miniatures are intrinsically important. They're the main component of those games. But in this we're talking about, do they add things to the board game experience? And the first thing is really, is that is personal preference. For me, not normally, but for other people, yeah. Not only is it a completely extra hobby within the hobby, just painting and putting together and just manufacturing these wonderfully produced miniatures, or just enjoying them fresh out the box and enjoying them in your games. They obviously have a massive appeal to people, and if they didn't enhance people's experience across the board as a rule of thumb, then they wouldn't be included in so many games because there wouldn't be people who wanted to buy them. The thing that frustrates me sometimes about miniatures is when they're in a game and they're fairly not important, but they up the price point. They are always gonna up the price point. The cost of making the molds for the miniatures is very expensive, especially for smaller publishers. So they are always gonna up the price point of a game. And sometimes I find that frustrating and I just think, give me the same game, make two versions and I'll buy the cheaper one with standees. I'm a big fan of standees. Standees are great. For me personally, I think the where I like miniatures is where they add big dramatic theme to the game. And I think when you're immersing yourself in a game and you have miniatures, or maybe you're playing a game based on aliens, the magnificent game, the corpse is a new alien game. Having the miniatures and you can see the alien coming for you. And it's not a chit, it's not a token, it's a miniature and it's there and you can see it encroaching on you. I think there, they really do add something to the game. Should there be minis in everything? No, I don't think there should. Sometimes I think you should leave it out. <laughs> but if they release miniatures for Viticulture, would I be buying them? Yeah, of course I would, because I'm a sucker and that's my favorite game. <laughs> question two is, might be a weird question, but I've always loved chess because of it being a 100% strategy. Are there any games that are similar to chess yes and no I think we can all admit that chess is a classic right I think we're all willing to finally admit that chess might just be a classic but more than a classic board game chess is a culture on towards itself you know there's people who just play chess they're never going to play any other board games. There's people who are just playing D&D, Magic the Gathering, people who are just playing X-Wing, never going to play anything else. But chess is different. Chess is also seen as less of a game and more of a battle of high intellectual wit. And that's because the components of chess comprise of strategy, but it also comprises of memory, maths, and algorithmic retention in your brain, trying to remember what move is the best move statistically next? And it is 100% strategy. Are there board games like that? There are certainly board games modelled after chess. You have games like Onitama and Jarl and stuff like that, the Duke. These are games that have the chess look about them but are different. 
The problem is, is that the more complex a game gets, and I'm not saying chess isn't a complex game, it certainly is, but the more complex the actual board game gets with, with components and rules, more often that's where the 100% strategy aspect kind of takes a back seat. The second you've got cards in a game, you haven't necessarily got a 100% strategy because what card gets drawn adds a small element of luck. But there are some games that I would definitely suggest. The first two are obviously Go and Shogi. Go is also a culture and Shogi is a 15th century variant on chess at least that's from what i understand and that they, they change shogi changes things in japan where you can put characters back onto the board which is actually a thematic thing which i found quite interesting and go is again one of those games where there's a it's very similar to chess in the most ways it's the most similar game to chess in a lot of ways apart from the way the game is played if that makes sense conceptually the most similar but we're talking board games so let's talk about modern hobby board games that i think a chess player might be interested in the easiest place to start i think are with my favorite line of abstract strategy games which are things like czar yinch and divan most of the games in the gift series are fantastic those three i know are fantastic one of my other favorite abstract strategy games that i would suggest to someone like this would be tack the beautiful game and it's just wonderful games like ingenious which is just hidden just there or maybe games i have a few written down actually shobu i can see it up there I'm not just saying these games because a lot of them, apart from Ingenious, are black and white on a board head-to-head, -head, but they are strategy-based abstract strategy games with no luck in them. And they're all, in my opinion, fantastic. If you want to add more to the game but have a chess-like feel, you might want to try something like Tigris and Euphrates. I mean, Tigris and Euphrates by Rani Knizia or Yellow and Yangtze, which is the version I owned, a sequel to that. Certainly does what chess sets out to do, but in a different way. You're kind of, it's kind of got the same theme, right? Warring kingdoms. And the next question is just wondering, do people log digital playthroughs of games towards their board game geek collection? You do you. D do you want? You know, I understand where this comes from. And the question is really asking, do digital plays of games, playing apps or like playing them on your phone or on your computer does that count towards actually having played the game i think that is up to you do you feel it does or don't you i mean when you're logging your games you're doing it for yourself it doesn't really matter right there's no one's going to check you working out <laughs> so i feel like i mean i play i've played a lot of sagrada the app does that feel like playing sagrada against a real person to me it doesn't actually. I kind of it kind of falls a little bit short of really playing a game, though the puzzle itself is very similar. But maybe when you're playing apps and you're playing against an AI, it does feel slightly different, because well, I don't know why. It just to me it does. To you it might not. And if it doesn't, count it in your board game app when you're saying what you played and what you haven't but gosh if i couldn't count digital playthroughs of games especially now when that field has opened up so abundantly in the last year for whatever reason i would that made me feel even worse you know most 90 percent of my 95 percent of my gameplay in the last 18 months has been digital and spending time with people playing digital games has been fundamental and crucial to my mental health and my seeing me through this pandemic we've been having so to me it's up to you i guess is what i'm trying to say the next question is i keep seeing it written places but what does flgs mean now I do know what FLGS means. It means friendly local game store. But I'm not the expert on friendly local game stores, mainly because I don't have a friendly local game store near me. So I don't get to go to one. 
But I do know someone who runs a friendly local gaming store, and that's Tim Matiba from Meeporville in Las Vegas. So let's go over to Tim and see what he has to say. What does FLGS mean? Well, very simply, FLGS stands for Friendly Local Game Store. But what does Friendly Local Game Store truly mean? Well, as an owner of one, I'd like to tell you what it means to me. Well, I think we should start with the word friendly. The definition of friendly is pleasant and kind. So it should be a place when you walk into that you feel you're welcome. You're warm. You feel warm. It's a place that gives you comfort. The people inside are kind and pleasant. They acknowledge you when you walk in the door. And it should be your third place. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, your first place is your home where you feel safe, warm, and welcome. Your second place where you spend a lot of your time is at work. So a game store, like places of worship, pubs, parks, libraries, people have a third place that is theirs, that is special to them. Because if you think about it, you walk into a game store, everybody has the same passion, the same interest. They're there for the same reason, for the love of games. So it should be a place that's kind and pleasant and friendly, like a friend. So that's what friendly local game store means to me. And as a side note, if you ever happen to be in Vegas, please drop by Meepleville Board Game Cafe. I'd love to meet you. Maybe you'd have a chance to play a game. Well, anyway, let's bring it back to Matthew. Thank you, Tim, so much for coming on and being a part of the show. I appreciate it so much. And you answered that question in a way that I never could have because, I, I mean, I, I get the cold concept, but you've described it in a way that I never could have. I don't know. I want to go to Vegas now. <laughs> and our last question for this first episode is this. Morning, all. That's polite. What are the best small box or card games to play with a non-gamer? Many thanks. My first answer to this question is this, and you, it might be difficult to hear, but if that person does not want to play any board games, don't force them because that's your hobby. And they might not want to, if someone doesn't want to play a board game or they're a non-gamer or they're against games, yes, I fundamentally believe there is a board game for everyone that they will absolutely love. But if someone's got no interest in the hobby, you forcing them to play something is never going to work. But if they have showed an interest and they, they're a non-gamer, I certainly was a non-gamer at one point and showed an interest, what games that are small games that you can show them? I have some thoughts. The first thing is that I think that theme is a much more important part of the game choice than the mechanisms of the game. Ask that person what theme they like. Do they like a particular time in history? Are they interested in a certain you know, genre of book. Ask them what their favourite TV show is or what music they like. Ask them what films they've been watching. Then go and find what animal is their favourite animal. Because once you've got those bits of information, I know you can go onto Board Game Geek and look for games that have that about them. You're probably going to find something at least close. That theme part of it is really going to help and something I've used when I've been trying to get my brother to play games and I go I'm gonna grab that game because I know he likes that theme so I've got much more chance of him playing it. The second thing I always want to say to people when they're trying to introduce people to games is that all your games are more complicated than you think they are. So you don't want to patronize anyone or insult anyone's intelligence but always think of what game you're gonna go and then go for one tier lower down because we as gamers get used to all these terminology. I know what a deck build. When I find a new big deck builder, I know how to play 50, 60% of that game just from knowledge I have about other games. And so I'm only learning 40% of the rules, but to the new gamer, they're learning 100% of the rules. So maybe don't show them Dominion, show them Abandon or Artichokes. And that's something I always want to implore people consider when they're teaching a new person, a new gamer, a game, trying to get them in the hobby. In a vacuum and not knowing any information about this person, I always think that you should try something that's quick, simple, easy, 
fun, that you know really well, so that you can be 100% on the rules, which can inspire some confidence in them to ask you the questions. So you're not getting flustered yourself. And I've got picked out a few ideas. I think that push your luck is a really good first time kind of game thing to do. And I think games like Can't Stop or Stu, which is a button shy game, or Age of War and uh, Picomino, which are both uh, Reiner Knitsche games, are all quick, easy, exciting games to play. Push Your Luck is a really good mechanism to get a new gamer in because it's just inherently exciting. And, you know, you're trying your best and you get it. No, and, and you can have those celebrations. But go light, find what they are interested in and just really try and consider what they would want to play. Not the game that you want to play, but you just need a second player. If you really want to inspire them into the hobby, tailor that experience to that person, is my suggestion. So that's it. Thank you so much for watching the first episode of Matthew Answers the Internet. I really appreciate you being here. And if you like the video, I'd love it if you could thumb it up, is what we say, and comment. And if you've got any answers to any of the questions, better answers than what I've got for you, then please drop them below. I want to thank Tim again from Meepleville for coming on board for this pilot episode and joining in and being such a wonderful person to have on and an expert answering a question that I couldn't answer. I appreciate that massively. And he's from Meepleville in Las Vegas and I know that he is serious and genuine when he says he'd love for you to hang out and drop by and play again. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Matthew, and I'll see you next time. Bye.